Hey, storytellers, guess what? You don't have to be big to do outsized work. When it comes to creativity, size doesn't matter. Consider the success of a true crime podcast called Bear Brook. You may have listened to it. It's been downloaded more than 21 million times. And The New Yorker named it one of the best podcasts of the year. It comes from a small public radio station in the heart of northern New England, where some of the most innovative work in the country is being done on long-form audio documentary journalism. If you have any narrative ambitions, you have to listen to my conversation with Katie Culinary. She is the thoughtful, fast-rising editor at the head of NHPR's audio documentary team. She spent the last year crafting one of the clearest greenlight processes in public media and podcasting. She specked out what pitches this station will say yes to, what it says no to, and along the way, what makes for suspenseful, impactful, long-form storytelling. Storytelling that doesn't just matter in New Hampshire, but across the country and even across the globe. She shares that pitch process with us. And we dissect a This American Life story that started in a one-room New Hampshire schoolhouse. Welcome to Sound Judgment, where we investigate just what it takes to become a beloved host by pulling apart one episode at a time together. I'm Elaine Appleton Grant. Katie Culinary, I am very excited to have you here on Sound Judgment. Thank you so much for having me. A pleasure. Katie, you were assistant news director at WHYY in Philadelphia for about five years, and you built the first podcast to come directly from the newsroom. And then you went to New Hampshire Public Radio in February of 2022, so just a little over a year ago, to lead the document team. And this is a new role. So talk about what this role and this team was conceived to become. The original idea behind the document team was, you know, we've got incredible talent in our newsroom, people who have done really excellent, high quality, long form narrative journalism already. How do we keep this going? So that would be the senior producer reporters, Jason Moon and Lauren Chuljan, both of whom you know, just in one person have more talent than I've seen in my career in like five people. They're both just so incredibly multi-talented and excellent journalists, but also really excellent storytellers. And just that that firepower combination is, you know, why the station decided to say, okay, they've been beat reporters in our newsroom. Let's dedicate them to doing this kind of really impactful long form reporting all the time. So the document team was created. The document feed um, is the podcast where most of their work until this point has appeared. Enter me um, as their first full-time editor. My charge has really been to help to create the vision for the team going forward. When they first got started, the idea was like, hey, let's just try some stuff. Let's chase down some of our first leads. Once we get the editor, that's when, you know, kind of the future planning visioning begins. So I've really been working on a lot of that over the last uh, year. Part of that work was also creating a green light process where we could say, somebody's got an idea. What's the process by which we sort of run through that and vet it and get to an answer? Uh, You know, is this the right thing that we want to pursue next? And how do we evaluate that? Sounded simple enough. And and it actually was quite quite a complex process. Well, exactly. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted to speak with you is because you did create this very structured green light process. When you decided we need a green light process, I believe you went looking for one at another station or at a podcast network to see what existed. What did you find? I asked around. I talked to some folks at CBC. I talked to folks at This American Life. You know, I got some really excellent advice about the kinds of things that they think about when they think about show development. I also talked to another editor at WNYC, but nobody had like a document that they could point me to. And so... I felt like I was floundering a little bit. I sort of had this kind of loose collection of ideas. I'd also looked a lot at some really excellent materials on the NPR training website. They call it their their podcast blueprinting process, and that gives a really great guide. But it 
it, it fit elements of what I was going for, but but not the full picture. What did you do next? Yeah. So I stumbled upon um, some like a version of like a kind of general green light process that that some folks who had left NHPR were writing for just just special projects. I liked that they had this structure of sort of like a, a step by step process, you know, step one, here's what you do. And here are the different possible outcomes. And it really gave just sort of a clear sense for people who are going through that pitch process of, oh, well, like once I have this this idea that I've communicated, here's how that's going to be evaluated. So it, it felt like it gave me something that I could work with to try to adapt. So I tried to use that format and created a three-step process that begins with the pitch, talking about what what we're looking for in that pitch. And then the next two steps of the vetting process are really trying to get at two questions. The first one is must we, the document team, make it? Is this something that's really a good fit for the kind of work that we do? And then step three being, can and will we make it? And that's sort of a higher level strategic conversation that gets beyond the editorial and looks at, you know, are there potential exciting partnerships here that we could, you know, leverage? Is there a collaboration? Did we just get grant money to explore this very thing that we could put towards maybe getting like an extra producer to help us, you know, turn this around in X period of time? Or on the maybe more negative side for the person who's doing the pitching, you know, is this maybe not somebody who we can spare from the newsroom for three months to work on this because their beat's so critical right now? middle of COVID, we can't dedicate the health reporter to doing this podcast series yet. But the whole thing is really designed to answer those questions, try to keep it really transparent so that it's equitable and help people understand, you know, these are these are all the factors that we're going to be evaluating before we get to yes or no. We also tried to create a maybe, have some places where if the idea isn't quite in the right place, we could send it back to them and then they could like reshape the idea and bring it back to us. Okay. What I want to do is have you go through what this green light process looks like, um, you know, at a high level, not in enormous detail, but who is it for? Is this a completely private document? Is it public? So yes, right now it's internal, but I think it's the kind of thing that eventually we could branch out a bit. And we could go to even other stations in New England and say, you know, hey, I saw your reporter has that great line of coverage that they're doing about X. And we really think it has narrative potential and it's got resonance here in New Hampshire. Could we talk about a collaboration? And I think it speaks to the fact that there's a lot of power when you write things like this down, when you really distill what your show or your team does. Writing it down forces you to really have to think very specifically about that because you want to give people something to pitch to. That was actually a piece of advice I got from a colleague, um, Taylor Quimby on the show Outside In. He said, look, you know, I'm reading this. It's a great process, but I don't really understand what document does. I can't think of an idea that I might have that I think could be a fit because you haven't really described for me what document is and what you do and what you don't do. Ah. And that was like, just like blew my mind. It was so obvious once he said it. And then I really ended up spending so much more of my time, like less on the process itself and more thinking about, yeah, what do we really do? And what could we do? Um, But also what don't we do? And I think that that's a second piece of the equation that many, many shows, many newsrooms, teams just, they don't want to go there because they're afraid of missing something. Exactly. And I think it's a really, really good point. And I was really impressed when I saw that in the green light document, which you very kindly shared with me. Um, and it's something that I talk to new show developers about all the time, which is getting really, really kind of strict guardrails. What do we do and what don't we do? And people, yeah. especially n- newer podcasters hate the idea of saying, well, there's, you know, there's nothing I don't do. Well, of course there is, there has to be. Um, But it does also get to some bigger strategic questions, especially right now. So as I'm talking with you, it is Monday, March 27th. And at the end of last week, NPR laid off a hundred people or so. Yeah. Yeah. And which is horribly sad. Yeah. And so 
right now we're in this media environment, particularly in public media, where people are saying, well, my resources are very slim. And there are a lot of stations who are saying, we don't have the resources to do a podcast. Or there are stations that have been around trying to podcast for a long time, but they've been doing it without lessening the load on reporters. So yeah, get all your regular work done and do this podcast on the side when you feel like it, which is a losing proposition. So talk about where NHPR fits in this current mood and what your goals are for now having long form narrative shows. Yeah. It's been said of us, and I and I think this is really an apt description, that NHPR punches above its weight, especially when it comes to long-form narrative podcast work, the willingness to invest in that, to recognize that, hey, we've got really talented people here who, uh, you know, not not only have shown just like a passionate interest in this, but they do it and they do it incredibly well. I mean, Bear Brook is, is a yeah. great example. 21 million downloads. I could not believe that number. Yeah, exactly. You know, and just the fact that that was, I think, just an incredible combination of like the right super talented storyteller with the right story with the right support at the right time, because it's so much harder to have a hit now. <laughs> but the fact that the station as a, a smaller market station compared to others where I've worked is willing to go all in on that is really incredible. That said, the more that I'm under the hood, the more that I see that the talent itself is also really critical. That makes a huge difference in what you're able to accomplish. And those talents also exist beyond our team in the newsroom, too. But it also is a question of balance because the daily news needs of the state of New Hampshire are great. And the ways that NHPR works so hard to fill them, it has to meet a high bar if we're going to take a reporter out of the newsroom. And so I think that's part of why my job on day one from my boss, the news director, Dan Barrick, was create this green light process. So we have this ability to decide what's going to meet that threshold and how do we how do we vet these stories and how do we decide what's really going to be worth all of this time because it's it's a lot of time and not just people resources that go into it. Absolutely. Uh, and anybody who's ever done any of this kind of work knows that it's a tremendous amount of work to do long form narrative audio documentary work. So after Taylor Quimby said to you, well, I need to understand what the document unit actually does before I know yeah. what to pitch. That's a problem for creators throughout the entire podcasting and public radio sphere yeah. anyway. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times you think you might know what your audience wants or needs, but you're kind of going on a guess if you haven't done a lot of audience research. Then a lot of times I find people don't like the answer <laughs> that they get. Um, you know, hey, that can be tough. It can be tough to pivot once you see what people really want versus what the creator wants to make. So, yeah, that really was kind of a big part of the the process was really thinking about, okay, what do we really do? How could I really describe it? At that point, we had a body of work, but there's so much more potential that's untapped. At that point, it had been a lot of issues around uh, stories with issues around criminal justice and substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, we're we're not a criminal justice addiction podcast. How do we how do I think about something that's going to encapsulate what we've done, but also what we could do on other topics? And really, I kind of wrote myself into it. I kept writing and writing and writing all these different mission statements. And then finally, I kind of was like, oh, you know, like we're we're the newsroom's documentary unit, which really boils down to if there is a story that's happening right now that we can follow over time, and time really being that essential ingredient in long form, that there has to be enough time so that different things happen, people who are involved might change in this sense that you're giving people, hey, like we, you know, this thing happened, but maybe you didn't hear the whole story. So now we're going to try to tell you most of the story here that maybe you didn't you didn't hear. And that's really sort of what the team's work has really centered on. And so I started to think about, okay, how would I describe, you know, if I'm trying to break down those different ingredients to get people to that kind of work, how do I describe that? What are the questions that they want to think about? And that really became the guide for the pitch part of the green light process. What are the things that we're asking people to think about? There are a lot of things 
given infinite resources where you could say, well, we want to do an education audio doc on this topic. We want to do a substance abuse one on this topic. We want to do something about, I don't know, underfunding the arts or the change in the legislature or anything that really does unfold over time. And so what are the questions that you came up with to help narrow the scope? Right. And I think the, the the big thing that you're sort of getting at is how does something become from just like a general topic area or an idea to like getting to the heart of a story? Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's actually where like a lot of reporters just in general can struggle, even ones that are really experienced. Um, so we try to get people to think about who are the main people that are involved in your story What kind of roles are they playing? And I'm trying to be intentional about not saying characters. Mm -hmm. I've used that word a ton, and now I'm realizing, oh, it can be kind of problematic, and you might lose some of the nuance of that person. But, you know, so who are those people? What are they doing in the story? And what access do you have to them? What are the surprises, or like as we like to call it, the holy shit moments Every document story has several of them, just the things that make you, oh, my God, you're never going to believe, blah, blah, blah. The thing about this story is this. So we want people to start to think about what are the things that have surprised them that have either either happened or about the people who are involved. Is the story going to peel back a layer of something that maybe people thought that they understood before and explain it in a different kind of way? Really, at the end of the day, it's also, what's the story? A lot of times when I'm talking to reporters who come to me sort of informally with like maybe a loose idea, I'm like, okay, but uh, you know, I don't want to hear about the context. I don't want to hear about the issues just yet. All of that is extremely important. Tell me the story. What do you think the story is? And if they can get me something that has like a beginning and a middle at least, you know, and we want to hang on to the end, I think that that means that there's some narrative potential. Stuff has to have happened and it needs to be happening now And we need to be able, and this is for our team specifically, we need to be able to be there as it's happening and watching it unfold. And that's what makes it a document story. Now, a couple of years ago, I served as a Blue Ribbon Panel judge for the Podcast Academy. And it just so happens that one of the categories I was assigned was the documentary category. One of the problems I think that people run into is whether or not something is noteworthy. Mm. What is the lens that you look through to determine, is this worth our limited resources and the audience's attention and time? Yeah. Um, I think it kind of gets to that question of like, does the story itself help raise questions about something else that maybe people who don't live in New Hampshire are thinking about? Because the other thing that we thought was important for people pitching our team to know is the fact that 90% of our listeners are outside New Hampshire. That's meant that every document story really has to have beyond the local story. It's got to raise questions about something much larger. And often that means that the reporting is going to cross some state or maybe even international lines. We're going to go seeking the the pattern that maybe we're describing, you know, see if that's happening elsewhere, or we might seek experts or other people beyond New Hampshire. But the root of that story is still very much local because we're still trying to serve a local audience while bringing in people from outside the state into, into what's happening here. Yeah, people listening to this podcast as opposed to watching it uh, could not see the look on my face when you said 90% of the audience is outside of New Hampshire. That is very unusual for a statewide news organization that's focused on local news. And there are some, we won't get into this now, but I just do want to acknowledge that there are some leaders of public radio stations that would say that's not the function of local public mm. news. But that is that is a really remarkable number, 90%. Yeah. So to illustrate how this green light process works, I am very excited to dissect a story that started at NHPR and wound up as a This American Life story called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Quorum. The story is set in Croydon, New Hampshire, population 801 as of 2020. It's the tale of how free staters and budget cutters attempted to cut the school budget more than in half. This is the very beginning of the story. And as I said, the reporter is Sarah Gibson, NHPR's education reporter. This story starts at a school budget meeting. In Croydon, barely anyone goes to these. Even the local TV guy did not show up this year. So there's not even a recording. 
but I'm going to tell you about it because what happened that day triggered a very strange series of events. The meeting takes place at the Croydon Town Hall. So talk about the genesis of this story. Yeah, you know, so... I was on the job at NHPR for about a month when this went down. You know, I heard that, like, this town just sort of, like, unexpectedly cut its school budget in in half. And then there was this outcry and this effort to, like, fight the budget cut and how could we restore this funding. The political lines were really kind of, like, not what you would think. We're so used to right now with all these battles over education happening Liberal Democrats versus conservative Republicans. And then it's getting mixed up in the culture wars and stories about book bans and school boards and all these things. But in this community, it was a really like you had a lot of the people who were fighting um, to restore the budget were conservative Republicans themselves kind of teaming up with some more liberal Democrats. And then you had this whole other group that I had never heard of before called the Free State Project that was pushing for the cuts. So just seeing the, you know, unexpected dynamics at play really made me go, okay, I'm I'm really curious now. And there was something for us to be like documenting in real time this effort to try to restore the cuts. And all these people that Sarah had access to. So that was a moment where I said, okay, this really feels like something that people in New Hampshire want to know what's going on. And then people beyond New Hampshire are really like, wait, hey, what's going on? You know, because it's so resonant to all of these big conversations that we're having about public education right now and about democracy. And there was absolutely a holy shit moment because we're talking about a one and a half million dollar budget that got cut to about eight hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, everywhere you looked, there was like, what, what, what? Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, talk about a holy shit moment, and it happened, you know, in the blink of an eye. Let's back up just a second and talk about the intersection between your green light process and how this story wound up on This American Life. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, I think a lot of people might feel really jealous when they hear how it all went down (laughs) because it's like, if only it were that easy. Um, I I still can't quite believe it myself. I was introduced to this story about a month into my job. And, you know, part of my part of my role was to scout out stuff that we could do in the future. And when I learned about this, I thought, oh, my gosh, wow, I can't believe like the perfect story has just fallen into my lap like a month in. This is so great. And you heard about it because Sarah- from the reporter. Yeah, Sarah came and told me. I was still at a point where I was going around. I was doing a lot of one-on-ones in the newsroom, trying to get to know people. And Sarah said, well, let, you know, let me tell you about this, this wild thing that just happened on my beat. And the more we were talking about it, the more I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and, and it's happening right now. And there's going to be this revote in May. Like, like the time is now, like we've got to like circle the wagons here and like figure this out. And so I kind of spun up a little mini green light brainstorming process that ended up becoming a bit of like a test case for the ultimate green light process that hadn't been written yet. You know, I asked Sarah to come up with a pitch and pull a sizzle reel, like, you know, pull a bunch of her favorite tape that she had so far from the people she was talking to in the community um, and all the different sides of this and present it to a group of people, all the members of the document team, as well as some other folks from the newsroom and our podcast unit. Just to kind of say, okay, does everybody else see what we're seeing here, that there's tremendous long-form narrative potential? And everybody pretty much agreed right off the bat. And then the question was, okay, well, then what what form could this take? We sort of coalesced around this idea that maybe it wasn't like a serialized podcast, that if we wanted to just tell the Croydon story, even while including you know, a lot of nods and overtones to the larger education situation and and democracy situation across the country. Like it really felt like a contained story that would really just stand by itself, maybe in like a half an hour, an hour. And then once we got there, that's when a couple of people, including our director of podcast, Rebecca Lavoie, were like, you know, this really sounds like the perfect This American Life story. Like, why don't we pitch them? So fast forward, we decided, yeah, sure, let's do that started drafting up a pitch, hadn't sent it in yet. And then I remember I was digging in my garden on like a Saturday and I knew Sarah was out in Croydon doing some reporting. She was following some canvassers who were organizing around this revote. And all of a sudden I checked my phone 
And I see she's sending me these like panic text messages, like my sources are getting calls from this American life. And I was like- but you had not pitched it to them We yet. had not pitched. We were getting ready probably the following week to send off a pitch. Um, and we start, We actually, we started panicking. At first, it didn't really seem like a good thing. We thought, oh no, we're too slow. <laughs> like, you know, they know this is a great story too. Like- Damn it. Um, But then it turned out that um, a really wonderful producer was just making some kind of casual calls on it. Um, His name is Chris Benderev um, and his editor, Laura Starcheski. And and he were just kind of kind of scoping out the story. Um, You know, they'd heard that this crazy thing happened. I think it's quite possible, actually, that they had seen Sarah's initial coverage, uh, you know, for NHPR on it. And we're just kind of like, what is going on here? You know, had all the same impulses that we did. So it was very frightening and validating. And then once we got in touch with them, they were very quick to to say, and actually very gracious to say, hey, you know what? Like, we've got a local public radio reporter on the ground who's already been telling this story and covering these issues in the state. Like, yeah, let's work with you guys. And Laura and Chris actually worked with us on the pitch that they ended up pitching to the rest of their colleagues at This American Life. And it became, it was an an adaptation of the pitch that we had already written, originally intending for it to be something for the document team. The team over there went for it. And then by that summer, the piece was out. And it was actually a fairly, even by This American Life standards, a pretty quick turnaround um, because they also wanted to kind of seize on the moment to of the story. What did they recommend that you change in the pitch? Do you remember one thing? Oh, gosh. Um, You know, that's a really great question. For us, our fascination really was around this group, the Free State Project, that that libertarian-backed movement that I mentioned earlier that was helping to push the cuts. But that ended up being something that This American Life was less intrigued by, and they really kind of encouraged us to shift the focus more to these bigger questions about democracy and less about the more New Hampshire-specific um, mm. political dynamics. Mm-hmm. So I think that mm-hmm. the pitch became this cautionary tale and less about all these mixed up political lines and these big questions about education. Well, and that makes sense, at least the political piece, because if This American Life is looking at it for, you know, a national and international audience and the Free State Project is um, fairly specific to, say, New Hampshire and Colorado, maybe a few other states at this point, uh, then it's going to have somewhat limited appeal, I imagine. And it's something for people to really think about is like, who's your audience? Uh, Thank you for sharing the genesis of that story. I'm going to play that clip one more time. It's short. In Croydon, barely anyone goes to these. Even the local TV guy did not show up this year. So there's not even a recording. But I'm going to tell you what I was particularly struck by having listened to the whole this American life story, is how subtly this reporter treated the issue. And I'm curious to know how intentional it was to keep it very subtle. One was what happens when there's no news coverage in a small town? Even the local TV guy didn't go to this budget hearing, she says. And it's practically the first sentence in the whole story. And the other theme is what happens when we don't participate in civic duties Mm -hmm. in the way that we once did. We learned very quickly there are around 40 people at this budget hearing, at this town meeting. But no one ever comes out in this story and says, you need to care about your local news or you need to do something about civic education or anything. None of that is happening. Tell me about the decisions made along the way to make these points, but make them very subtly. Um, It's interesting that you brought up the local news coverage angle, because that's not even one that we've discussed that much at all. But to us, the the two big things that we've really seen when we look at the Croydon story is the democracy question of like, wow, this is what happens if people don't pay attention, don't show up, you know, don't vote. And then the other big questions that, that are being raised here about 
you know, the quality and the cost of public education. This American Life decided to really focus on the democracy question. Um, and I think that was also how a lot of people in the town, you know, that, that resonated with them as well, in addition to the, to the other education questions. That was very intentional because even when you have a piece that's about a half an hour, I think up until that point, this is the longest piece that Sarah Gibson, the reporter, had ever done. You still really need to refine the angle and you need to zero in on one element of the story. And I think the subtlety with which they presented it, you know, matches the the ways that I think This American Life, but public radio in general, like that's our ethos, right? We're not here to tell you what to think, but you also sometimes you have to like call a spade a spade. And I think in many ways, this story does an excellent job of showing while not telling that this is the realities that community members face when not all of them of different viewpoints show up to have their say. Exactly, exactly. And it is interesting that when you're used to doing, say, maybe if you're lucky every now and then a six minute story and you get half an hour, it can sound like you've got oodles of time to, to weave a new narrative, but a half an hour is not really all that long. And you do still have to make very conscious choices. But I want to move on to the introduction of a character named Ian Underwood. So Ian wrote a pamphlet that he circulates at the town hall meeting where the budget was cut. And this uh, pamphlet is called Budget or Ransom. And this scene also introduces another character named Tom Moore, who is an outgoing member of the school board. He's a parent of three kids in the public school. And Tom, when he walks in, doesn't expect anything unusual at this very small town meeting. And he finally looks down and he reads this pamphlet that had been shoved into his hand when he walked in. And here is that clip. As I'm looking at that, people are starting to get really upset about how much we're paying the principal and the superintendent and about violins and snowshoes. And there just seems to be a lot of people kind of up in arms. It's like if you wanted to design an instrument that could be easily broken by second and third graders, it would be the violin. This is Ian Underwood. He's the guy who wrote that pamphlet. (laughs) It goes on to introduce who Ian Underwood is. He is a member of the Free State Project. And um, he's had it with the size of this school budget. And what struck me about this are two things. And again, I know you didn't directly edit this story, but it sets up what can be a really, truly tedious thing going to town meeting as this conflict between not two sides, but two actual people who have real stakes, right? There's my taxes on the one hand, there's my belief in, you know, what I think about what public education should or shouldn't do. Um, and, and my, you know, seemingly reasonableness about, yeah, third graders are likely to break violins and, you know, his counterpart who believes in public education has three kids in public school has a lot at stake if that budget shrinks. Is that something that you think about a lot? Like who are the characters and how are we going to set up this conflict almost immediately from the get-go? You know, you you want to establish these as your leading people, you know, as as people um, who have wants, desires, needs, and those are really idiosyncratic. I think the hope must have been that people might have thought about that for some time, like, oh, you know, like they're both raising some really interesting questions. Tom is gonna is looking at having to pay nine thousand dollars to send his kid to public school, which is supposed to be free, other than like the taxes that you pay. Whereas Ian, who's got a totally different out you know, outlook and and view on what public education really is and how much individuals should be required to pay for it, you know, even if they don't have kids in the school system. So it's really getting down to these fundamental differences between the two of them. And I think, you know, the role of any storyteller is to get people kind of thinking about those things, especially I think in audio, you know, you're spending time with these people, maybe a bit more than you would have in, say, a four-minute piece. 
So you're getting a chance to think about how another human being who you might fundamentally disagree with is thinking. And the hope is that spending time with that person, even for just a little bit longer than, say, 30 seconds, is going to help give you a, a, a richer understanding. And that's, I think, the real beauty of long, of long form. I agree. And I think also the real beauty of it is that we have the opportunity to bring these things down to such concrete, specific details that just stick Mm -hmm. in your head. You know, you hear the snowshoes and you think of the violin, the little tiny violin, and you're, you're there and it becomes so much richer, more fun. To, to make and more fun to listen to. And more memorable. Yeah. Much more memorable. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The last clip I'm going to play is introducing two other people who become really the central focus, I would say, of the rest of the piece. And they are twin sisters, Angie and Amy. They sort of scramble after they hear that this budget has been cut to try to reverse that decision. And what that requires of them to do is to find a way to get 283 people to come to a Mm revote. And if they don't reach 283 people, and remember the whole town is only 800 people, then they're going to fail. Amy and Angie are driving from house to house, trying to convince people to come to the revote. They've never done a campaign like this before. We're bad at this. They they say, we're not registered voters. Okay, that's fine. (laughs) Angie and Amy grew up in Croydon. Their car has an American flag tinted on the back window. The reason I wanted to play this is because the entire rest of the piece is suspense. This Mm. could be practically the same setup that you use for true crime. What's going to happen? All along the way, every single reporting and editorial decision is made to, to... make it more suspenseful. Are they going to make it? Are they going to get this person to come to the meeting? Are they not? Is someone going to run out the clock at the meeting? What are the votes going to be? Et cetera, et cetera. When you are working on, you know, a green light pitch, say, for a long form audio doc, how much are you thinking about how much suspense is in this piece? What is the big question? Can we, can we actually keep planting that question in the listener's mind. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, that's sort of, that's that's everything. That's the kind of thing that really takes it from an in-depth feature story to, is it is it really a narrative? To what extent is time an ingredient in the piece? Are we going to have to wait for something to happen? Like, are what are the plot points? Is there is there a whole backstory that we have to tell that gets us to, you know, how we got here and where we're going? At the end of the day, it really comes down to, can you tell a story that has that beginning, middle, and even if that end is still like unfolding, you know, that really helps justify the amount of time um, in some ways that you end up spending with a long form piece, both the time that the that the audience is hearing, um, you know, say like a six hour podcast that's told over eight chapters slash the time that maybe you're spending investigating that story. Katie, after, you know, about a year working on this green light process and starting to really get super intentional about the document unit at NHPR, are there things that you've learned along the way in crafting and recrafting this green light process that came as a surprise to you? Interesting. Um, uh, the biggest change really came when I had to define our mission, which is so hard and is a big challenge, I think, for any, forget podcast, I think any, you know, any newsroom, any team within a newsroom or any podcast, any broadcast show, honing in on exactly what you do and and what you don't um, is really hard. And because, why? Yeah, it can be, exactly. And why are you doing that thing? Um, and how much time do you devote to it and, and who the resources are going to be, where the resources are coming from? You know, especially that what we don't do question. I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think it's something that, that so many shy away from because being able to say no to something means that you're really confident in what you can say yes to. And I think 
even just getting to that place can be a little scary. There's also can be this fear of what are we missing if we say no to something? And I think in many ways, a lot of podcasts, news organizations, teams, you know, have been revisiting that question as especially as many of us in media are realizing that there's many people that we've left out of these conversations, many audiences that we haven't considered. So, you know, reconsidering those things is is always part of the game. You know, that's why you have to be really intentional about what you're doing and who you're serving and getting really specific about who you think your audience is and how you can best serve them is another element that I think can be really scary and people shy away from because I I think so many of us are afraid that we don't know the answer or that we don't know how to arrive at the answer. Mm. Um, But those are the Mm -hmm. places where it's worth spending the most time because then that way you know that you're really, if you're spending all this time to, to tell this story, you have to know that you're connecting with the people who are really going to most need it or want to hear it. Fascinating. Katie, thank you so much for being here. And uh, are you having fun doing this job? Yes, I am. I am. This has been um, my dream job. And I feel, yeah, just incredibly grateful to be working with such talented people who are really yeah, just just really dedicated to doing impactful long form journalism, and um, just you know, totally pinch myself. It's great. Well, they're lucky to have you. Thanks. Thanks, Elaine. At the end of every episode, I give you a few of the many takeaways from these conversations. Today's takeaways are about how to pitch your long-form story or limited series. One, what are your holy shit moments? What are those surprises in the plot or about the people in your story that make you say, wow, you are never going to believe this? Holy shit moments help get your pitch accepted and they generate word of mouth. Two, in your pitch, identify people, characters, who have high stakes and are in conflict with each other. Make sure you have access to them, too. Frame your story through their eyes. In the This American Life story we dissected here, why it matters that one man imagines an eight-year-old breaking a violin and another is terrified at the prospect of paying thousands to send his kid to a public high school. Snowshoes and violins make important things memorable. Issues alone do not. Three, here's a three-step pitch process for long-form narrative. First, write a text-based pitch. This can be a short query letter or a full-fledged slide deck, depending on who you're sending it to. Two, produce a sizzle reel. Use your best tape from whatever you've collected so far. If audio production isn't your strong suit, ask for help. Three, get feedback from friends, colleagues, or a coach. Choose good storytellers or folks who have a great understanding of your potential audiences. Revise as necessary. Four, editors and program directors in public media have tough decisions to make about podcasts. Done well, they can grow your audience enormously, but managed poorly, they can rob newsrooms of talent and even hurt local news. As Katie says, the daily news needs of the state are great. A long-form project has to meet a high bar if they're going to take a reporter out of the newsroom. The new green light process helps them decide how to vet story pitches and decide what's worth listeners' time and reporters' time. This process can help any newsroom and any podcast network. That's all for today. Thanks for being with me. If you liked this episode, you may love episode 10, Glenn Washington of Snap Judgment, Lessons from a Master Storyteller. That link's in our show notes. Please follow us on your listening app. Our goal is to help you make great creative choices every day. And you can help us do that. Take just one minute right now and give us a five-star rating and a short review on Apple Podcasts. Everything you do helps us grow our new show, and we're grateful. Sound Judgment is produced by me, Elaine Appleton Grant. Sound design and editing by Andrew Perella. Our gorgeous cover art is by Sarah Edgel. Podcast management by Tina Basir. See you soon.
So I'm like a retired opera singer for (laughs) lack of a better word. Yeah. My father is an opera conductor and he was, he was on the staff at the Met at the time. And, um, I met the then head of the children's chorus and she was this very like gruff lady, like, you know, known for instilling fear in the hearts of, of 10 year olds who were going to appear on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera. And she said, do you sing? And I said, yeah. And so before I knew it, I was like whisked downstairs to the kids rehearsal room and, um, she had me sing happy birthday and she came back upstairs, threw a bunch of sheet music at my parents and said, she's in. And like two weeks later, I was singing at uh, at Carnegie Hall for a memorial service for some large donor. I mean, it just, I got like sort of thrust into that. So for about three and a half years, I was a member of the Children's Chorus. And it really was just a wild experience being on stage, you know, with all of these people in these major productions to sing for about, you know, all all this build up to sing for about two minutes, um, you know, really prepare me for a career in public radio <laughs> where you're waiting around and then you get on and then you're like, OK, whew, lots of work to do before I'm back on the air again. 